It's time for another season of The Palmetto Porch, an original podcast from Discover South Carolina. I'm Devin Whitmire. Join me as I get to the heart of what makes South Carolina such a great place to visit by speaking to the locals who make it so special. Premiering December 5th, find The Palmetto Porch wherever you get your podcasts. And for more information about our show, visit scpalmettoporch.com. Okay, it's time for you to put on your thinking cap, because if you could get into the greatest minds of science, physics, space, innovation, and technology, what common thread would you find? What is it that inspires ordinary people to seek out the extraordinary? Let me tell you the one thing that compels them to start thinking outside the box. They actually look towards the skies. That's right. The most accomplished innovators are filled with this sense of wonder and imagination. Their whole life is consumed with this unquenchable desire to solve the mysteries of seemingly the infinite universe. I'm America's digital pro, Kim Commando. And in this Commando On Demand podcast, we're going to talk about this rare and beautiful astronomical event. It's a super blue blood eclipsed moon. Anyway, it's going to grace our skies on January 31st. And depending upon when you hear this podcast, maybe you've already seen it and you were amazed the first of its kind in a century and a half. And not only has it captured the attention of the world's astronomers, it's actually piqued the interest of history buffs and theologians. Apparently, there were some pretty significant events that took place when this moon showed up last time, and that was over a hundred years ago. And the events actually parallel what's happening today. In this podcast, it's going to be really fun because this moon is totally photographical. Unlike the solar eclipse, this one is going to sit still for a while, so you can actually grab some amazing shots. And coming up in this podcast, we're going to answer the questions that everyone's asking about it, when, where, and how to do it right. Just the other day, I got an email from the award-winning scientist, author, and educator, Mr. Andrew Fracknoy. You might remember the super rare total eclipse that happened last summer. I sure did. I went to Wyoming, and it was incredible. Anyway, Andrew was the expert guest on my two-part podcast about the eclipse, which, if you haven't heard, go back and listen to it. Everything you wanted to know about deep space and eclipses, I'm going to tell you, it's on those two podcasts. When Andrew emailed me, he was knee-deep in the exciting world of technology, and sometimes I forget to look up. So he's the one who reminded me about this awesome lunar eclipse. So I put down everything, and I gave him a call. He was so excited about what they're calling the super blue blood eclipsed moon that I recorded our conversation, and we turned it into a podcast. His biography alone is long enough for an entire podcast, but let me just give you an idea of his level of expertise. Mr. Fracknoy teaches introductory astronomy at the Fromm program of the University of San Francisco. He was selected as Professor of the Year for the state of California by the Carnegie Endowment for Higher Education. He was elected honorary member of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, and his credentials go on and on. So as you can imagine, I'm so very honored to have him join us on this podcast. Andrew, I just want you to share now with our listeners of the podcast what you shared with me about this really unusual lunar event. Absolutely. That sounds great. So we have something very exciting coming up. It's a blue moon, a blood moon, an eclipsed moon, and a super moon. It's all wrapped up in one. What the heck is going on out there? So yes, on January 31st, we have a triple event coming in the sky, uh, something which is quite rare. We have a total eclipse of the moon. Those are not rare, although they're quite beautiful. But it's happening at the same time that the moon is being a blue moon and a super moon. And that triple threat is something that we don't get too often. But Andrew, what is really happening in the sky? I know what we see, but what's the physics behind all of this? Just pretend we're all super smart and we're going to capture every single thing that you say. Lay it on us, buddy. What's really happening in the sky is that the full moon is going to go into the shadow of the Earth. And that will mean that the beautiful lit up full moon will get darker and darker and darker. And when the moon is in the Earth's shadow completely, then it's going to turn a kind of blood red color. 
because the red color is better through the Earth's atmosphere than the blue colors. And so that will make a, a kind of blood red eclipsed moon on the morning of January 31st. So this will be a full eclipse that most people will be able to see, right? Well, it is a total eclipse of the moon, but unfortunately it's happening in the morning and the further east you are in the United States or North America, the less of it you'll be able to see. In the eastern parts of the country, the moon will set before the total eclipse really begins to happen. But if you live in the western half of the country, then you will be able to see a great deal of this total eclipse. And uh, that should be quite beautiful and it lasts a long time. The only disadvantage is you'll have to get up pretty early in the morning, that Wednesday morning. Now, you said with this particular event, with everything lining up exactly as you said, it's very, very, very rare. Okay, so it's rare. But... How rare is it exactly? Well, this is an interesting question. We haven't kept track of supermoons. This is a relatively new idea. A supermoon is something in which the moon gets to be full just as the moon in its normal orbit around the Earth is a little bit closer to the Earth. So the moon, because it's full and closer, is a little bit brighter, a little bit bigger looking in the sky than usual. Uh, astronomer Joe Rao went back through the records to see what was the last time that we had both a total eclipse of the moon and a blue moon. And the last time we had both a total eclipse and a blue moon at the same time was about 152 years ago. This is quite a long time ago. Now, the next one is going to happen in 2028. So it doesn't always take 152 years. But the last time this happened was more than a century and a half ago. But the supermoon itself, really cool to look at, but... It's not that rare. The supermoon is pretty common, so it doesn't take a lot for the moon to be full just at the moment when it's closest to us in its orbit. And so this is actually the third supermoon in a row. The one we're going to be watching in January 31 is actually the third month in a row when the full moon happened right around the time that the moon was closest to the Earth in its orbit. Uh, astronomers never took this seriously until the media started pointing it out and gave it this very sexy name of supermoon. All right, but where exactly does the blue moon come in? The blue moon means that the moon is full twice in the same month. And that happens this month. We had a full moon New Year's Day, and now we're having another full moon at the end of January. So that's called a blue moon the second time it happened. This is exciting for a number of reasons, because the last time this happened, a hundred and some odd years ago, there wasn't the technology to be able to view it or capture it on film very well. But all that has changed. So this event happened a hundred and some odd years ago. Let's talk a little bit about the technology, because let's face it, we hardly had any a hundred and some odd years ago. That's correct. And I should point out for those of your listeners who don't have like really fancy equipment, that total eclipses of the moon are very democratic. Sometimes you can uh, have astronomical phenomena which are only visible if you have very expensive telescope equipment and only the 1% can ever see it. But this event is made for the 99%, for the rest of us, as they say in politics. You don't need anything to see the eclipse and it's perfectly safe to look at. Since a full moon is safe to look at, when the full moon goes dark, that's even safer to look at. So you don't need those special glasses that you needed for eclipses of the sun. You don't need special equipment. If you have a pair of binoculars, you can look at the moon with binoculars, but you don't need them. Just go outside that morning, find the moon, and then watch it get dark over a long period of time. Great, that's awesome that this eclipse is so user-friendly, as you put it. And of course, it's happening at different times in the morning all across the United States. So what time do we actually need to get up and get outside? If you're in mountain time, then the total eclipse will be visible from 5.52 to 7.08 a.m. 
And if you're in the Pacific time zone, the total eclipse will be visible from 4.52 a.m. to 6.08 a.m. So in this case, it's really important to get up a little earlier than normal that Wednesday morning. Maybe go to bed early and plan to get up a little earlier and then dress up really warm and go outside. And since the total eclipse lasts 76 minutes, you don't have to get there at any moment. You don't have to get there at the very beginning. For me, for example, on the on the West Coast, the total eclipse ends at 6.08 a.m. So I'm not going to get up at 4.52 and watch 76 minutes of this total eclipse. I'm going to get up toward the end of the hour before the eclipse ends. So I might get up at 5.45 and go outside for a while and then wait until the eclipse ends at 6.08 a.m. So everybody here in the United States will not get equal viewing. Some do have to time it just right. Is that the idea? The idea here is that people in the eastern and central parts of the country are only going to be able to see a little bit of this eclipse if they get up before dawn. And so it's very important that they not be disappointed. So we want to point out to them that uh, the eclipse on the eastern seaboard is pretty much over before the total eclipse begins. And in the central time zone, there's a few minutes of total eclipse, but pretty soon the moon will be setting right after the eclipse becomes total. So we apologize for that, but sometimes it works out better for one side of the country than the other. And this is a better eclipse for the western part of the country. Well, I guess I'm one of the lucky ones for this event anyway. Now, I want to make sure that my listeners know where to go if they have any questions, because they all love technology, but a lot of them are also eclipse chasers, astrophotographers, and just deep space fans in general. So, Andrew, any recommendations? Well, absolutely. I have a website online, which is at fracknoi.com, F-R-A-K-N-O-I, Com, and I'm going to have lots of information with all these times about the eclipse in the blog section of fractnoid.com. But you can also just Google this. It's going to be all over the web close to January 31st. Uh, good places to get astronomical information are Astronomy Magazine, which is at astronomy.com or space.com. These are sources for, for good, reliable information about what's happening in outer space. Andrew, you've been terrific as always. I so enjoy having you on our podcast, and I know that my listeners appreciate you too. Thank you so much for all the great info. My pleasure. Thanks for calling. Now, all this talk of Blue Moon just makes me want to, well, makes me want to sing the song. A little guitar, please. You saw me standing alone. All right, you caught me. That's not really me singing. It's a group called Blue Note. I wonder if they would let me audition, though. All right, and now for this nonsense. Coming up, we're going to talk about the best ways to photograph. Are you ready for it? The Blue Moon. Now, let's find out how to get some awesome pictures with my next guest. Jeremy Judkins. This guy's so cool. He's a complete tech freak. And I don't use that word very often, but Jeremy absolutely gets into tech like crazy and then posts these amazing tutorials on his YouTube channel. He's kind of a fun-loving guy, and I guess people love him back because he has over 50,000 YouTube subscribers. Hey there, Jeremy. Welcome to the podcast. What's up, guys? All right, so you bought a camera, you started taking pictures of the moon, and what happened? When I first got a DSLR where I just thought, you know, in normal light, I could take really good pictures. But then once you get to the next step, like you go outside, you point your camera at the moon and then it comes out crappy. All right. We've all been there. I feel your pain. But now your shots are great. I've seen them. Really nice work without spending a fortune. So take us step by step just through the basic so we can at least hope for a decent shot. So if you have your camera on auto mode, you want to get it off of that because that will do no good when taking a picture of the moon. DSLR camera, got it. Set to manual, got that too. All right, what's next? So we have it on manual and the things that you'd want to focus on changing, 
would be like the shutter speed. So if it's on auto, it may be defaulted to like 1 60th of a second. But honestly, that's too slow. It's gonna let in too much light. The moon's gonna be too bright. So we're gonna turn it up to like 1 500th of a second and that will make the moon dimmer. Now these settings aren't gonna be perfect. You're gonna to wanna to play around with them, but this should really be able to help you out. Understood. I mean, we're not taking pictures of a really bright moon on January 31st. So we can afford to play around with the settings a little bit to get a clear image. Next step. And then the f-stop, I mean, you can play around with it, but that's not gonna have as big of a effect on the picture. If you have a zoom lens, it's probably not gonna have much of a range anyway, unless you've spent a lot of money on the lens. Some will, some won't. It depends on how serious you are about photography and how much money you have to spend on it. So what's next? And then another thing you want to worry about is the ISO. If you have it on auto, the camera is most likely going to crank the ISO up really high, which will result in a lot of grain. So you want to bring it down to, you know, like maybe two to 400, just play around in that area. If you do it too low to like 100, the picture may be too dim, but you can kind of, you know, fool around with ISO and then the shutter speed to kind of get the best picture. It's like with any art, you have to find out what works best for you. That's how you perfect your craft, by trial and error. Anything else? That's really it there, just knowing those few settings. But as long as you stay off auto, you will be able to take a decent picture of the moon. Thanks, Jeremy. You can find Jeremy Judkins on YouTube, as I said. He's really into drones and phones and Macs. But be sure to check out his moon coverage on the Mavic Night Flight. It's pretty awesome. But let's say you're not the type who likes to play around with camera settings because it always turns into a disaster. Well, David Peterson from Digital Photo Secrets, he's got some great information on his website. He goes into way more details, and I just want to recap a few of his recommended settings. For the very best shots, you need to own a digital SLR and a telephoto lens that allows you to zoom into 200 millimeters or more. If you can afford it, he suggests using a four or 500 millimeter lens. This will allow you to get in close enough to make the moon your focal point. And if you really wanna fill the frame, go for an 800 millimeter. If you can afford it, you can use a 400 and just crop the image. But you'll also definitely need a tripod, that's a given. I really love those tiny details on the moon. The more detailed, the better. So to get close and clear, David recommends taking the camera off of auto and using the spot metering setting instead. Spot metering tells the camera to correctly expose what's in the center of the image rather than the whole thing. You're also gonna to wanna to turn off your autofocus and set the focus to infinity. If your camera has a bracketing feature, this will allow you to take a number of photos at different exposures. That's so nice. If you have to choose between over and under exposure, always go for the under. You can always fix the image later in a graphics program. So the bottom line, start with your ISO at 200, an f11 aperture and a 1 125th of a second. Try a test shot, then try changing the shutter speed until you get that perfect shot. And here's that trial and error thing again. Remember, the only way to perfect your craft is to try a bunch of settings a bunch of times. This rare and gorgeous lunar event will be on the sky stage for a while, so you have plenty of time. And if you really want to get serious, check out David Peterson's online video course, Digital Photo Secrets. It's always good to try new things. You never know, you may catch that shutter bug and have a whole new career. Remember when I spoke of great minds at the beginning of the podcast? Great minds are always exploring new territories. They're breaking new ground. And a great way to find out what captures your interest is to cruise through my website, learn about new technology, listen to the experts on my podcasts, then take that simmering idea of yours and turn it into something bigger than you ever imagined. And I just want to remind you, you can subscribe to my podcast in the Apple Podcast app, Google Play, or however you get your podcast delivered to you. The moon is surrounded by superstition, but let's not forget about the romance. Whether you're head over heels in love or swimming in tears over a lost love, take time to let this special moon wash over you with all its beauty. Let the presence comfort you, inspire you, 
remind you of just how awesome it is to be in the presence of such a spectacular event. Let it fill you with a new sense of awe, wonder, and most importantly, hope. I'm Kim Commando, America's Digital Pro, and I'm hoping you get to enjoy this wonderful historical treasure on January 31st. And if it's past January 31st and you're listening to this podcast, if you have any great shots, make sure that you share them with me over on my Facebook page. That's facebook.com slash Kim Commando. Thanks for listening to this Commando On Demand podcast. If you like what you hear, be sure to share this information with your family members and friends. My podcasts are available on iTunes and in the Google Play Store, but the best way to listen is to get them in the free commando.com app. Just search for Commando in iTunes or Google Play. Oh, and by the way, would you like to watch my show live or maybe on demand on your schedule? You can if you're a Kim's Club member. Learn more at club.commando.com. And also, as a Kim's Club member, you can even come by and be my guest in the studio next time you're in Phoenix. And to listen to my show wherever you may be all across America, go to commando.com slash radio. You own a business? You run a journey. You own a business in 2022? Wow Business knows that journey just got a whole lot more interesting. You might close a sale like this. Or like this. And you need to connect with your team. Hi, everyone. Hey, guys. Uh, is my camera on? <laughs> Can you hear me? Can everybody go on mute? Without even leaving home. And if you're excited to keep your business moving, head to switch to wowbusiness.com to learn about fast internet speeds, 24-7 U.S.-based support, a price lock guarantee, a 60-day satisfaction guarantee, and an offer you don't want to miss. For a limited time, fall into savings with one gig of business internet for the incredibly low price of only $99.99. We'll even throw in four months of free service, free installation, and a free modem to help make the switch easier. Learn more at switch to wellbusiness.com. Offer for new customers with a two-year agreement subject to change. Prices do not include taxes, fees, and equipment charges. Restrictions apply. Switch to wowbusiness.com.